In this day and age where males can't give their opinion about female anatomy, let me clarify something. As a white looking Hispanic male, I cannot represent women because I am not a woman. But if I was, this is what I would say. Pasito tum tum, pasito tum tum, pasito tum tum, pasito tum tum, pasito tum tum. Marilyn Monroe and Megan Fox, two of the most well-known actresses, models, and above all, sex symbols. Their beauty labels have brought them fame and success, but with the cost of losing their identity in order to represent an image that strips them from their individuality, consequently affecting their long-term careers and personas. For one, it's already too late. For another, has woken this awareness to atone for the image we place on women who are labeled as beautiful but are devalued as meaningless. Now, whether you look at Merlin and Megan as good actresses or not, that's not the point of the video. This will be a look into their careers, what's their place in modern Me Too feminism, and what does our perspective of beauty standards say about us. So let's get on with it. Merlin Monroe, Megan Fox, what do they have in common? It ain't, it ain't hot, hot to, to be, be pretty, pretty after all. all. When looking at their careers, they might seem at first glance they have nothing in common other than being labeled as the most beautiful women of their time in a magazine. But looking at their upbringing and bumps, they may seem they have much more in common than what they seem. They both came from a divorced family, they both dropped out of school at a young age, they both started as young models that later evolved into acting careers. Marilyn Monroe was considered the sex symbol of the 50s, and Megan Fox was the sex symbol of the 2000s. They later faced bad press, were criticized by the public media. How they were first introduced to their sexual awakening brought them insecurities which later affected their careers in the long run. Monroe started off as Norma Jean Morrison, born on June 1st, 1926. Her childhood was marked by sadness and abandonment after her mother suffered a mental breakdown from paranoid schizophrenia, which placed Norma into several foster homes as an orphan while her mother was locked up in a psychiatric hospital. At age 8, she was sexually abused by one of her foster parents, and this wouldn't be the last time she was sexually abused. As she spoke about how he told her to come to his room one night, now you can't get out, the man told her, as reported by New York Post. Even a foster parent had sexually abused her after taking her behind a barn when she was only 11 years old, as reported by the Daily Mail. Megan Fox was born on May 16, 1986 in Tennessee. She grew up in a strictly religious household, which according to Megan, brought her insecurities about sexual topics as she said, I was raised Pentecostal, which is one of the most extreme denominations of Christianity that exists. Everything is evil and wrong and will send you to hell. So I had a lot of talks about how sex was evil, sex was bad. As they both dropped out of school and then moved on into modeling and then acting, Norma Jean Morrison changed her hair into blonde and her name into Merlin Monroe, paying homage to the sex symbol of the 30s, Mae West. When I'm good, I'm very good. But when I'm bad, I'm better. In 1947, Monroe made her first debut in a small cameo as a waitress from there on, she was typecast in small roles as a dancer, or a wife, or a desirable secretary. Megan Fox debuted her acting career in 2001 in the Olsen's twin movie as a mean girl. At first, she was typecast as the high school mean girl. She also had a small cameo as an erotic dancer in Michael Bay's sequel to Bad Boys 2. How they both garnered individual attention was from the likes of All About Eve and Transformers. Even though Monroe had a small cameo in All About Eve from 1950, the film won an Oscar for Best Picture, which attracted her much attention for her astonishing looks and wit. A waiter. That isn't the waiter, my dear, that's a butler. Well, I can't yell a butler, can I? Maybe somebody's name is Butler. She continued to appear in small cameos, but by 1953, her role in Igera established her as a household name making her the star of several romance comedies at the high peak of her career, with Gentlemen Prefer Blondes, How to Marry a Millionaire, 
There's no business like show business, the seven-year itch, and the best movie of her career, Some Like It Hot. In 2007, Megan Fox was cast in the Transformers franchise. The movies were a big hit worldwide that it granted her recognition and the attention of men. But after each other's success, that's when their luck went from gold into gush. Soon after, Monroe's personal demons started to take a toll on her. Her childhood insecurities and abandonment made her want to look for the validation of a love figure. A father figure, to be exact, the one that she never grew up with. But after three failed marriages and two pregnant miscarriages, this led her into a deeper pit of depression. Monroe gained a reputation of being hard to work with, always being late to the sets and forgetting her lines. Would you like it any better if I knew him? And it slips her mind? <sighs> Can we start again? Yeah. Yeah. The pressure was so big that while filming The Misfits, she suffered a mental breakdown and was instituted into a psychiatric hospital for 10 days, repeating the same fate as her mother. After she recovered, she returned to finish filming The Misfits alongside to his role model Clark Gable, the actor she grew up admiring and fantasizing to be her father. Honey, when you smile, it's like the sun coming up. But after filming wrapped up, Gable died four weeks later, and the cause of his death was blamed on Monroe for stressing the actors out with her breakdowns and causing production delays. This placed her into a much deeper depression. In 1962, she worked on the film Something's Gonna Give, but her unprofessional attitude resulted into getting her fired from the picture and bad pressing her for her mental breakdowns. After the studio changed their mind to rehire her again, on the 4th of August, 1962, Norma Jean Mortison, aka Merlin Monroe, was found dead at home in her bed from an accidental suicide overdose. The film Something's Gonna Give was never finished. The downfall of Megan Fox came after she made negative comments to the Transformers director Michael Bay, comparing him to Hitler and how he was a nightmare to work with. Soon after, she was fired from the third movie and replaced instead with a blonde model. What followed was a train of bad press insulting her, mocking her, and diminishing her as an actress. She would star in Jennifer's Body, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and low-budget movies that typecast her as the hot chick, and would get harsh criticisms in every work she was in, tarnishing her star power and any credibility she was trying to get as an actress. And I gotta say one thing, Megan Fox, you know, look, one of the worst actresses in Hollywood. The, the bad press did to her as it did to Marilyn Monroe, putting her into a mental breakdown from all the harassment. I didn't want to be seen. I didn't want to have to take a photo. I didn't want to have to do a magazine. I didn't want to have to walk a carpet. I didn't want to have to be seen in public at all because the, the fear that I was going to be mocked or spat at or someone would yell at me. Ever since then, she's been a mother, worked in a comedy show, and attempted to resurrect her career into more serious roles. So, what went wrong here? The only answer that I could find was that they were labeled as sex symbols. A sex symbol is usually a renowned person noted and admired for conspicuous sex appeal. Since the beginning of film, the sex symbol was a marketing tool to attract audiences, which as well included male sex symbols, but unlike the males who were presented as authorities with power, wit, and charm, the female sex symbols were presented as one-dimensional figures to gaze upon, lacking any personality or ambition. Since they were written by men, for men, our masculine pleasures were placed as first priority before understanding the well-being and the needs of women. What are you doing here? Looking for shells? No, I'm just looking. Once in a while you got strong independent women, but most of the time they were reduced into three different roles. The first is the disturbing victim. If the female was too independent, embraced her sexuality and didn't go with the social norms, then she deserves to get punished for provoking males to gaze upon her, placing the blame on the victim. The second is the damsel in distress, where they are dumbed down to look weak and incapable of taking care of themselves so they must need a strong man to look after them. The third is the Fiend Fatal. If women are too beautiful, they are cunning black widows who use their looks to get what they want. Thus, they don't deserve to be trusted. So the problem with Monroe and Megan is that any woman who is labeled a sex symbol or beautiful 
are harassed and hated for being beautiful. We get the wrong assumption that they deserve all the abuse for being beautiful, or they are too dumb for being beautiful, or they are untrustworthy for being beautiful. Not only do they work in an industry that hates women, but it's very discriminatory once they pass the age of 40, placing unnecessary pressure to stay young through plastic surgeries, which can be more damaging than good out of fear of being labeled too old, not beautiful enough, or just simply done. I was never more beautiful. And then I turned 40 and they threw me away. And when their personal life goes tough, instead of receiving help and treatment, they get dehumanized for not fulfilling their high expectations as eye candy. And it didn't matter how many times I spoke up and said, I'm hurting, this isn't right, I need someone to protect me, this is going on, someone needs to listen. It didn't matter at all. So in the case of boat actresses, the typecast that Monroe was placed in made us believe that's how she really was from her real life persona. She was cast as the naive bombshell, unaware of her sexuality, thus it gave man the notion to take advantage of her. So men are following me. Really? I can't understand why. She was the dumb blonde. How do you put it around your neck? You don't love it, it goes on your head. You must think I was born yesterday. And she also was the gold digger. That's why I'm glad we're going to Florida. What's in Florida? Millionaires. The attacks on Megan Fox not only aimed at her professionally, but personally. She was blamed for choosing roles that exploited her sexuality, thus labeling her as a disturbing victim. Yeah. Because to be honest, I'm still terrified people will say, well, she was a stripper. Like, does she really have a right to talk about being sexually objectified? Or she, you know, made that choice for herself. Her roles would get panned for being too sexy to be smart. I'm having the best day since, like, Jesus invented the calendar. Jesus didn't invent the calendar. Whatever. And if she opened up her true feelings about something, she would be labeled as hard to work with. I have friends who are fem who are actresses who, if they go to work one day and they show up on set and they don't have a smile on their face, then they're, they're tagged a bitch, and that is really unfortunate. But also the sex symbol has a stigma of meaning talentless or worthless. Marilyn Monroe didn't mind her roles, but she wanted to expand to do more serious roles other than the dumb, sexy blonde. It's not that I object to doing musicals or comedies. In fact, I rather enjoy it, but I would like to do also dramatic parts too. And Mega Fox never felt comfortable with the label because she never viewed herself that way. She was self-aware how the industry was marketing her, putting no effort to bring the best talents out of her. How sexualized I was and how I was like reduced to, I mean objectified is like, it's not the right word, it doesn't capture what was happening to me at the time. We don't think of Megan Fox's latest projects like her comedy show, her archaeology series. We think of all those sexy frames that made her seem like she had no talent or personality or ambition. We don't think of Marilyn Monroe in her more serious roles like Clash by Night, River of No Return and her last movie The Misfits. We think of her more popular generic roles as the dumb blonde like the seven year itch the staple that embodies her whole career with the white dress lifted up. In the film, she doesn't have a name or a character. She's just a girl. The film even breaks the fourth wall joking that the girl was like Marilyn Monroe. So it's sending a message that this nameless character and Marilyn Monroe are the same. They are two naive, beautiful fools who men can take advantage of. In fact, that scene was shot several times with hundreds of men and photographers looking at the dress lifted up. And it's no wonder how this is her most popular scene in her whole career. If there is a positive side about being a sex symbol, it's that they get the attention, love, and admiration for their looks. As simple as that may sound, but there is more to someone showing their skin in a bikini. Since nudity is a taboo conversation, women are taught to be ashamed of their bodies or to look at themselves as a source of temptation for man's downfall. This builds walls and insecurities on women who can't express themselves. They're not allowed to show confidence on their bodies or they fall in the disturbing victim category. But as I've mentioned in other videos in the past, it's been proven from psychological studies that women and models that show their skin 
can help them boost up their confidence and eliminate their self insecurities because not only do they get to know their bodies, they get to fully appreciate themselves instead of view their bodies as sinful. We are all born sexual creatures. It's a pity so many people despise and crush this natural gift. As well, they confront the fear of nude shaming. For a long time, it's been assumed that if women reveal their bodies, it means they're attention seekers or they're slut shamed. Compared to the double standards that show it's okay for men to reveal their upper bodies when as for women it's degrading, placing a false notion that not only is female nudity disgusting, but it is to only serve our manly desires. So, let me clarify something. Women who want to look pretty or show their bodies or look healthy whether it's their strippers, models, or just a friend, that does not mean they're looking for sex. Their bodies are not for men, it's for themselves. Because it's part of their job, or they just want to show confidence, or want to be healthy. There can be consent to enjoy someone's body, that's okay, but not at the expense of devaluating the person. Oh my god, you know the hot wire car? So hot. If there is something that Merlin Monroe and Megan Fox have shown is how beauty standards change and evolve through the decades and centuries. What may seem beautiful right now may not have been beautiful a thousand years ago. That doesn't mean someone is not attractive, it means everybody is different and unique in their own way. Some might look at Mona Lisa right now and say, well, she's ugly, but back then she could have been the Angelina Jolie of her time. The beauty standards of the 50s were defined by the glamorous looks, red lips, and voluptuous curves. Curves were a big deal at that time. Even ads would advise skinny women how to gain curves. Through the 60s and 70s, the beauty standards changed into thinner, flat-chested bodies like Twiggly and Jean Trimston. The 80s morphed into the athletic, aerobic bodies, tall and big hair from the likes of Madonna and Olivia Newton. The 90s was the decade of the heroin skinny-like bodies like Jennifer Aniston, Courtney Cox, Michelle Pfeiffer. The 2000s was defined by tan skin, flat bellies, belly button revealing, upper chested like Britney Spears, Paris Hilton, Jessica Alba. In our present time, it's become more inclusive but still emphasizes daily makeup, big lips, gymnastic bodies, and big glutes. So beauty is anything more than personal preference any curvy girl or muscular, thinner, shabby, tall, short, or whatever can look at their body and be proud of it. If there is any positive message that the sex symbol reflects, is that unless you know your body and appreciate it, you can't fully appreciate how different someone is and celebrate their small details that makes them unique. It might sound contradicting to be a sex symbol and a feminist at the same time, but for a term as feminism which describes women as modest and recognized by their abilities instead of their bodies, can a sex symbol be a feminist? Well, it's harder for women who are sex symbols to be respected by their intelligence, but even intelligence can be objectified as sexy, not just in women alone, but even in men as well. So the question is, can you still be beautiful, smart, and respected at the same time? Yes, no, maybe. That depends on what the social environment looks for in women. Monroe came into fame after World War II, a time when soldiers had to suppress their horny feelings during the war until they returned to their wives and started the baby boomers. So for a decade as the 50s, which were the most conservative and most closeted horny, Monroe was the fantasy that fueled man's long decade of suppressed desires. Megan Fox came right after the 90s, one of the most sexually objectified decades for women. During the 2000s, there was more concern about terrorism and foreign outsiders after 9-11, meaning there was no concern to remove any demeaning portrayal of minorities or women. But no matter what side of the argument both actresses sided with, they were rejected by women because of their framing gaze. After all, Monroe was known to be the gold-digging, dumb blonde bombshell in most of her pictures, when in reality, she was anything but dumb. People associate if you happen to have blonde hair, or if you're not out of shape in some way, you're absolutely dumb, I mean, you're considered dumb. 
I don't know why that is. It's very, I think it's a very limited view. She could sound eloquent in her interviews and be outspoken about her frustrations with the industry and the way she was being objectified without concern of her talents or even her health. We are not machines, no matter how much they want to say we are, we are not. I want to be an artist, an actress with integrity. Monroe barely had any female friends, so the only people she could be with were men. In her case, she wasn't looking for sex, she was looking to be appreciated for being herself, not because of her body, when all of her life she was being valued for her body. And the fact that she died at age 36, before turning 40, before getting disposed by the industry, this cemented her as the crowning label of glamour and beauty. We will never get to see her age and lose that image that every beauty label is afraid to lose. She died with that title, thus labeling her as an American pop culture icon that has been capitalized, merchandised, celebrated, homaged, and parodied ever since. At this point, we don't look at Norma Jean, the person. We look at Merlin Monroe, the symbol. Not the orphan who was abused and harmed all of her life. Not the civil rights activist Merlin Monroe who helped an African American to become a singer during the harsh times for black prejudice. What makes you so sad? I think you're the saddest girl I ever met. First man never said that. I'm usually told how happy I am. In the case of Megan Fox, when considering herself as a feminist, she was ostracized from the Me Too movement because in the eyes of feminists, she's a disturbing victim. You know, I was sort of out in front of the Me Too movement before the Me Too movement happened. Like, yeah. I was speaking out and saying, you know, hey, these things are happening to me and they're not okay. And everyone was like, oh, you, we don't care, you deserve it. Ironically, her favorite role of all time, Jennifer's Body, is her most sexualized role and the most feminist role she's ever had which was screenplayed from a female's point of view by the same writer who wrote Juno. Like, I don't feel like there's a space in feminism for me. You know, even though I consider myself a feminist, I feel like feminists don't want me to be a part of their group. It's about a popular high school girl that turns demon-possessed and eats boys after a ritual sacrifice goes wrong. The movie was heavily panned and critics diminished any possibility Megan had to be a serious actress. I was stupid, I was offensive, I was a waste of space, I was a bad actress, whatever, well, all, of the, all of the things you can think of, I anticipated. But lately, the internet has been apologizing for how they treated Megan, that now the movie has garnered a cult following which tackles the inner insecurities of high school students falling under the pressures of social statuses. Look, how could I ever be insecure? I was the snowflake queen. Yeah. Two years ago, when you were socially relevant. I am still socially relevant. In fact, Jennifer's body has now become part of feminist film studies that teach how a social message can be overshadowed by its overly sexualized marketing, and the reason the movie suffered was due to the male audience expecting two hours of Megan Fox exploitation, and instead were very disappointed to get a witty horror comedy with barely any nudity in it. As Roger Eber once said, it is the twilight for boys. They said, what would you improve about this film? And the kid wrote, needs more boobs. And that was the data that was collected and taken seriously. So if feminism can represent a woman that is confident of her body, who is outspoken, it can also be someone who inspires. If Mae West was an inspiration for Marilyn Monroe, then Marilyn Monroe was an inspiration for Megan Fox. As Megan used to have a tattoo of Merlin, until she removed it when realizing the pit that Monroe fell into. As Megan once said concerning to Merlin, she had all the potential in the world and it was squandered, she continued, and I am not interested in following in those footsteps. If Monroe represents someone who was consumed by the Hollywood label, Megan represents someone who tries to escape from it, as she's been getting a career resurgence, taking serious roles that emphasize her talents as a serious actress and a comedian, instead of emphasizing her body. But to Monroe's credit, as an actress, she wasn't that bad. She could show raw emotions, be edgy, have a dark side layer to her, and be one of the boys who could get dirty once in a while. I hate your not your fashion! I give you back my tail! But truth be told, it is unfortunate how much potential she could have manifested. Well, for now, she can be remembered as a singer, 
visiting the US soldiers at South Korea and singing, flying away from work to sing happy birthday to President Kennedy at Madison Square Garden, and even had an affair with him and his brother. While as for Megan, there is still enough time to see her age and recognize her as not another disposable symbol, but a person. So what I'm saying is, you're not dumb for being beautiful. There's nothing wrong being called beautiful, and it's okay to be known as sex symbol, as long as it's done to empower the individual instead of controlling them, as long as it's not done to limit the person's talents and goals. And honestly, coming from an industry that supposedly has changed their treatment on women, seems like they haven't changed at all how they treat their female stars, and as a whole, the female image. Beauty in Hollywood is not a self-esteem booster. It's a merchandise that gets old and replaced by another beauty standard. But if Merlin and Megan can teach anything, not just to women, but even men, is that nobody should compare their bodies based on any social beauty standards. Because ultimately, they change any bulb, and no one will ever fall into perfection. Nobody should feel like a prostitute for being in touch with their bodies or being considered too attractive. If anything, they show you can demonstrate confidence with your body and still have decency left. In the end, there is nothing wrong to be labeled as beautiful, as long as it still acknowledges the person inside. Norma Jean Morrison was a dancer, a singer, outspoken, a civil rights activist, loved reading, and was anything but dumb. Megan Fox is a mother, a geek, loves archaeology, and believes in aliens. What it comes down to is consent. Consent for the body and the mind. Not just in women, but on people in general. And I think, I think that it is time that we should give that to all of them. Since I am no lady and I can't speak on your behalf, I can't say any of the absurdities you just heard me say. <laughs> so since that's the new norm, for the first time ever, this video will be officially unsanctioned. That means you never heard it, you didn't even see me. You think you're looking at me, but you're not. You're looking at yourselves in a black screen. Ah. You see what I'm doing? I'm getting inside your head, and it's working. So, since this video never happened, please do not tell me what you think about Marilyn Monroe or Megan Fox, or how beauty labels are mistreated, as well as sex symbols. I don't want to know. Do not give your thoughts in the comment section down below. And if you like this video, I don't care. Do not like and subscribe for more content. Well guys, I hope not to see you next time because when I get back, I will not be talking about the Soviet montage. So for now, that's it for today. <gasps> Ciao.